You told us that, that, that there were other forms of uh, connecting or uh, getting in touch with this uh, awareness uh, this, uh, uh, in addition to meditation. Meditation, in my mind, is a very, very broad category. I gave you one example of the mantra meditation or of focusing on the breath. The breath is just a different kind of mantra, if you like. You know, it's not a word. It's just focusing all your intention on something that's trivially simple, repetitive, that keeps your thoughts away. Well, you don't have to do either of those. There are other methods. One, you can get into a meditative state just by sitting down and closing your eyes and being quiet. You don't have to do anything. You can just let your thoughts go. Let the world go. You know, we all do this every time we read a good book. You sit down and read a good book, the rest of the world disappears. You're just a consciousness getting a, a data stream out of this book, right? And people walking through the room behind you, uh, you know, other things going on, you just don't, you're not attached to them. It's not that you don't know you're alive and in this house or, you know, whatever. You don't hear the person walking. You're just not attached to it. It just happens and it doesn't interrupt your focus. Well, that's like a meditation state. So we can get into a meditation state reading a book without any difficulty at all. Why? Because we focus our intention completely on what we're getting out of the book. The problem is that if we want to focus our intention on nothing at all, that's why we do the mantra. We can now focus our attention, instead of on the book, on this sound, or on our breathing, or on a candle flame, or on a mandala, you know, kind of trace the lines of the mandala. Anything that keeps the mind occupied so it doesn't run off chattering will get you there. All of that is meditation in my book. You see, now, some people only define meditation as a mantra or the breathing technique, and there's just various, very specific things about it, but these are all just tools. When we listen to music, the same thing happens. If we really like a piece of music, when we listen to that music, the rest of the world disappears. It's us and the sound, and that's all there is, you see. Well, now let's do that without the music, without the book. So you know, all of you can do it. You do it all the time when you focus your intention on the music or the book. It's not that hard. Now you just have to do it without the music or the book, and then we call it meditation. So just sitting down and being quiet and letting everything go, same thing. And when people begin to meditate, they approach it with an idea that this is a problem, this is a hard thing to do. You know, yogis spend decades learning to get to nirvana, which is just this point consciousness state. And here I am, and I don't know anything, and I'm not a yogi, and I'm going to do it in a week? No chance, you know? So they already feel defeated before they start. That's the problem. It's really a lot easier than you think. You just let go. So anything that enables you to relax and let go of your sensory input and of your thoughts will do. Some people do that naturally. Some people just automatically do that. They don't even know that it's meditation. They just do it. They've always done it. Some people who've been around the, the, the uh, evolution cycle enough times come in to this world doing that naturally. You probably all know children that drift, kind of drift off into their own world. Well, that's just a meditation state. And we grow out of it because our parents tell us, you know, cut that out, you know, get back to reality, pay attention to what I'm telling you. But just drifting off into nowhere and kind of losing yourself, that's a meditation state, you see. So there's lots of ways to get to that state that aren't structured at all. It can be entirely unstructured and it'll work just as well. Matter of fact, it's faster. Eventually you outgrow the need for the meditation tool and you just go into that state. You can go from, from a talking state like that into point consciousness in a tenth of a second and come back just as quickly. It's just easy. You don't need meditation. Meditation would just slow you down. Meditation's a tool, particularly a tool for beginners.
It gives them structure. It gives them something to do. You see, it's not about doing, but we give them something to do. And while they're busy doing this nonsense stuff, we let their inner being kind of come out in front of them because they're clearing all the other thoughts out of their mind. Okay. Another question? Gerardo. The concept of God, therefore, is a tool in this perspective. The concept of God, is it a tool? It can be. It can be used as a tool. You know, you can get to that meditation state through prayer. Right? And then you're using that concept as a tool. Prayer is another absolutely valid way to get into that state. You know, I've, when I write my book, I don't say the word God very often because it's so emotionally charged and everybody has their own sense of that and they have a lot of emotional things stuck to it and I didn't want to get into that emotional stuff because that isn't helpful. So I tended to use other words, um, you know, I don't say things like astral projection because that has all kinds of other overtones, you know, I just, you know, I don't like those, those words because they're divisive. But I've had any number of people who describe themselves as very religious. I'm a very religious person. Religion is my life. I take it very seriously. And I love your books, My Big Toe, because that, to me, the larger consciousness system is God. And it meets all the criteria the ones it doesn't meet is, there's no dogma, there's no creed, there's no ritual, it's just the larger consciousness system. It's aware of everything, your motivation, keeps track of all the history, things you're about to do. It likes to help you succeed, and do the right thing, right? It's the creator. We are consciousness. As consciousness, it's consciousness. We're in its image, right. We're consciousness, it's consciousness. We're just part of that same thing. We're all connected, we're all one. Love is the answer, you see. It fulfills all of the spiritual and fundamental requirements of religion, and it doesn't matter whether that religion is Buddhist or Catholicism or Islam or whatever else. It basically covers theology from a totally different viewpoint without the dogma and with, you know, it's just a different way of looking at it. And I've had any number of very religious people were just thrilled that now it all made sense. That they could put it all into a context and not only did it all make sense, but hey scientists, this is science. This works. This concept of, of, um, of um, consciousness does better physics than you scientists can do. It solves problems, you see. So it's, it's, not, it's not an anti-religious thing at all. It's just a different perspective on the nature of reality and you know, what's important and how it works. So yes, God can be both part of the fundamental concept, I call it the larger consciousness system, it's evolving, it's not a done deal. So you see, we take some of, the, some of the assumptions out of it. It's finite, it's evolving. It's not perfect, it's a system. But it's, and it's evolving. And we are parts of that system and we're trying to evolve too. And we're part of it. As we evolve, it evolves. We're all one. So yes, and it can be a tool. Prayer is a, is a perfectly good way to approach Meditation. Notice it's got all the same elements when you pray, right? You close your eyes, you're quiet, you get rid of all the thoughts. If you're praying and you're thinking about what you're making for dinner and, you know, should you get your nails done and all this other stuff, it's not really very effective. You're just kind of pretending at it. It's only when you let everything go and you're totally focused in that moment and with your intent that it's really effective. And it's the same thing with meditation. They're really very similar.
What's your name, uh, Nicola? Uh, you told us earlier that in order to uh, do uh, this uh, quest, when we had fears, these fears uh, could somehow become real and we could uh, make them exist. What is not clear is if, uh, because you say that it's important to address these fears before we uh, begin this search, or is it okay uh, to uh, start this search uh, once we f uh, face these fears to overcome them? Okay. Yes, you do make your fears come true. You also can make good stuff. You can make happy things come true too. Um, because your fear is expressing an intent and that intent will help change the future probability to make that fear come true. And what do we put the most energy in? What gets us at the deepest level, the most tied up, the most, you know, it's our fear. So we tend to make our fears come true. That's just the function of this reality. If you have a fear, and that fear is a deep, strong fear, you will manifest that fear. So you have the fear, say, that nobody will like you, that you are unlovable, you're not really worthy, and this is your fear. The way you will probably act because of that fear is to turn people off, to be rude, to push them away, because you don't want to give them the chance to reject you, which is what you know you deserve, is to be rejected. So you don't give them a chance, you push them away. Well, what happens? Nobody likes you. Your fears come true. You see, you've created the problem. You have a fear that your teenagers are going to you know, get into drugs and, and uh, you know, get in with the wrong crowd, so you don't let them go out of the house. You know, you lock them in the closet, you send food in under the door. You say, you're going to stay in there until you're 25, you know, and then I'll let you out. Well, what happens when you do that, when you're that over constrictive, as soon as they get out, the first thing they're going to do is everything that you told them not to do, because that will make them feel better, that they're getting even besides they have all this pent up stuff, and you will push them in that direction to make that come true, you see? So we act in a way to make our fears happen. We manifest them. But the opposite also can happen. We can make good stuff manifest too. But typically as the good stuff happens, we just don't put a lot of energy into it. We just lay back and say, ah, oh, that feels good. The fear we grind on, we dream about, we crunch on it day after day after day. It gives us ulcers, you see, we focus on it. So that's why we're so much better at making our fears come true than we are at making you know, our hopes come true. Now, the question is, do I have to get rid of the fear before I start doing these things, or is it going to get me? That depends on how much fear you have. I wouldn't say, don't start until you get rid of your fear. You may never start. Just start the process. You're going to start the process of getting rid of your fear and start the process of exploring the larger conscious system. You'll know it if the fear is a problem, because the first time you get out of body, the first time you get in that point consciousness state, something will scare you and chase you back. Well, that's just your fear. Eventually, you'll have the courage just to face down that fear, and whatever it is that scares you, you just stand up to it and say, give it your best shot. I'm here. I'm staying. You're not chasing me out. That's courage. And guess what? That scary thing, whatever it is, will pff, like smoke. These, these things that frighten us are paper tigers. They're not real. We create them, you see? And if we have the courage to stand up to them and let them do their worst, they just fade away. They turn into smoke and vanish. But it takes courage to do that. So I'd say they work together. You don't have to get rid of the fear first. But what will happen is if your fear is too great, it will prevent you from going further. Then, yes, you'll have to work on your fear first because your fear is preventing you from going forward. But if your fear lets you go forward, if it's not so much that it stops you, then it's okay. Go forward. So work everything together. Tengo algunas preguntas que me pasaron por escrito. Al morir, uh, 
uh, when we die, in what moment uh, does uh, awareness or consciousness uh, leave the body? Uh, must uh, some time elapse uh, before you are incinerated? No. No, when you, uh, in the death process, and again, there is no real death, you know, but in the, in the virtual death process, sometimes the consciousness vacates the body before the body's even actually pronounced dead. The body may still be breathing. Sometimes people who are in comas, who are lying there and they, you know, they're brain dead, basically. There's nobody at home, you know. There's nothing but a shell there that is still going on because the rule set won't let it die yet because they keep pumping in food and pumping out wastes and doing this kind of stuff. So the rule set just keeps it alive. But the, the, the soul, if you will, and I talk about a, a um, individuated unit of consciousness, if you like, you can call that a soul, or you could call it a spirit, or you could call it your non-physical part. It's, uh, it's all basically the same thing. But that leaves when the probability of you coming back gets low. Okay, when it's like there's no point staying here anymore because there's no more choices, you're unconscious, you're, you know, you're whatever, you're not any longer able to play the game. You're not, you can't make choices in that state. Well, then there's no sense in being here. So it's gone. Body could still be alive for that matter. So mostly for people who are dying of old age or, or an illness or something like that, that, that uh, soul, that uh, non-physical part departs when that person departs. You know it, it all happens right then, you know, when they get the last, take the last breath and it's gone. And that's, that's when the, the, uh, the consciousness wakes up and finds itself in another reality frame. It's like, oh, what's this? Oh, wasn't I just dying? Uh-oh. You know, where am I? What's going on? And if they're fearful, that's when it starts to get a little scary. But if they're not, they're going through the process. It's very easy. Esta pregunta es de Rosy. ¿Quieres levantar la mano, Rosy? Wait, 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 wait. This question is uh, from uh, Rosy. Can you raise uh, your hand, uh, Rosy, so he can see you? Uh, an astral uh, a journey or trip uh, equals uh, an entry into uh, consciousness in the large uh, consciousness uh, system. An astral journey is the same as uh, an entry into the system? Yes. See. That's just another terminology for it. The first times that people went, quote, out of body, you see, they called it astral projection, and they got that from the Hindu theology that has the physical plane, the astral plane, the causal plane, the mental plane, and they have all of the structure in their theology, so it was called astral projection, going out of the body. And it's unfortunate terminology because it started from a belief that the consciousness or the soul lives in your body, right? Is there spirit and it lives in your body and it has to come up out of your body and go someplace. Well, that's not it at all. When you're sitting there playing your elf in the world of Warcraft, you don't live in the elf's body. You're just consciousness. You're getting the data stream, that's all. There's nothing living in your body. So you don't go out of your body. You just connect to a different data stream. So it doesn't have to do with your body. Your body isn't critical to any of these things. The body's beside the point. Your body's just data. It's just a virtual body and a virtual brain. It's not the seat of your soul. It's not where your consciousness lives in a little house inside your head, you know. It, it doesn't work like that. Your consciousness, you're getting a data stream, and that data stream you interpret as this reality. Remember the Matrix? Did you all see the movie The Matrix? And they were all in these little capsules someplace, and they were getting the data that was plugged into them here, and that data gave them the whole reality? Well, it's sort of like that. You're just getting information, and you're interpreting it as this, 
this reality. So it's not like there's this physical body that's fundamental and then there's the spirit that lives inside of it and the spirit has to get up and go out of your body. That's a belief. And when you have that belief, you start creating all kinds of things to substantiate the belief. That's why beliefs are not good. If you read the old literature about astral projection, everybody who projected astrally had a silver cord attached between their shoulder blades back to their body. You see, that's just the way it was. If you, were an ast you, know, if you did astral projection, you better have your silver cord. It's sort of like the hose that went down to the diver, right, with the air hose. That was your lifeline back to the body. And if that cord got cut or something happened, you'd be lost. The body would die, the spirit would go off and never, never land, and it would be awful. And people who now do out of body, same thing, astral projection, they don't have any cords. Why don't they have any cords? And that belief has gone away. You don't need a cord. Why do the people move through the tunnels of light? Because they believe if they don't move, they can't get anywhere. You see? It's habit of thought. So if you have this belief about the soul living in your body and being attached to your body and the reason your body can act is because the soul is in there animating it and the soul goes out and travels, soul travel, then the body's left without a soul, that's dangerous and so on. That's just a belief based in an ancient idea where the body, the physical body, was the fundamental reality. And the soul was the kind of the airy reality, you know, a different, it doesn't work that way. So, um, yeah, I was looking at another question. I guess that answers it. Yeah. Uh, somebody who has uh, left a physical body can come back uh, uh, to get something back from a past life or for some reason to a past life. Okay. Can somebody uh, um, this is like leave the body to go out and get something from a past life? Sure. Or you can, just, you can just do that in a meditation just as well. You don't have to get out and travel. See, this travel is another metaphor. You're not really traveling anywhere. It's not like you're going someplace where they keep the history. It's all consciousness. There is no distance in consciousness. That's a habit of our thinking for being in this virtual reality. This virtual reality is computed. It's a 3D computed reality. Just like The Sims is a 3D computed reality. There's no distance in The Sims. Those characters that are walking down the sidewalk in The Sims, they're not really covering distance. They don't walk off your screen and across your desk. You know, they're not doing that. It's just simulated distance. It's the way it is here. There is really no distance. You don't have to travel anywhere. But yes, from an out-of-body state, you can be out there. That's just like a point consciousness state where now you've attached, you've attached to a, another data stream. And you call that data stream your out-of-body experience. And from that place, you can use your mind to say, I'd like to go see or experience you know, my last life or the life before that or whatever. And if that's your intent, it's like a query to the database. You're going into the database with a query. I'd like to get this information. The database comes back to you with an answer. All you have to do is be open and receive it. If you start analyzing it and judging it, whatever, you'll destroy it. Just open and receive it, but be skeptical of it, okay? It has to have meaning for you or it doesn't matter where it's coming from. So. It's not necessary to do an out-of-body in order to get this data. All you have to do is get in the point conscious state and say, this is the kind of data I'd like to have. It's your intent. It's just like putting something into Google. You type in that little text box of Google, and you hit the button, and back comes all the data based on your query. Your intent is the way you query the database. When you remote view, you're looking at the database. You're looking at data in the database. When you heal and you say, I want to see that, uh, you know, black is the bad stuff, white is the good stuff, I want to see the health of this, that's just a request. That's a query to the database. You're going into the database that has the information about that person's health. You're getting the database, you're getting the data out, and you've told it you want the data displayed in a black and white picture. 
So you see, you can get into those databases just with a query. Now, just the same as a query, that is not precise. If you go to Google and you type in love, you'll get six million replies back, two-thirds of which you'd really rather not see. You see, because it's such a general term, you have to be very focused on exactly what you want. If you say, I want to see a past life, you may get a hodgepodge of stuff that covers over a thousand things and little bits and pieces, and then none of it makes any sense. You need to be more precise with your query. If you think of it as a query to a database, you realize you have to be precise. And sometimes, just like in Google, sometimes you'll Google something, you'll get too much, and you'll say, well, okay, let me add another word, or let me take one word out that makes it a little narrower, and I'll get, you know, and after a couple of tries, you get it to return what you want. You do that here too. You query the database and you get stuff you don't want. You say, oh, I see I wasn't very precise there. I'll add this to it. I'll put this caveat on it and try it again. And then you'll get something else. Two or three tries, you very often get exactly what you want. But see, if you don't know that the system works that way, you just go out, you do something general. I want to experience a past life. And you, nothing really makes sense because you didn't really ask a precise question and then, and then you say, well, this stuff doesn't work. It didn't, doesn't work for me. It didn't make any sense to me. I got all this stuff and none of it made sense. Well, that's because you don't understand the system and what you're doing and how it works. Once you do, it becomes a lot easier, you see, to control it. So you don't have to. Yes, you can is the answer, but you don't have to. There's no advantage in first going out of body and then going to uh, examine a past life. But shortly you'll get bored with past lives. They're not all that important. We can talk more about those later, about how you can get into that database and what the database is like and how you can sort through the data. Because remember, in that past database, there's not only everything that did happen, which is where your past life is, your history thread, there's also everything that could have happened but didn't. So you've got all that data there too and if you don't know what you're doing you can wander around in that unactualized history that never did happen but could have so you have to be precise about what you're talking about what you're querying okay these uh, questions are uh, by uh, gerardo garza can you raise your hand uh, gerardo mm -hmm. What uh, do we understand by uh, out-of-body experiences? Why do they happen involuntarily? How can, can we uh, uh, drive them or uh, cause them uh, to leave them? Can they be directed or targeted? Um, the answer to the last question is yes, they can be directed. You can learn how to, uh, to uh, produce them and how to control them. And why do they happen spontaneously? several reasons. One, the person has really grown to that point where they're ready for that. It's a point where that experience is kind of next on their growing up, on their seeing bigger pictures and understanding things. So it just happens. They're ready for it. Um, sometimes it's because the larger consciousness thing, system um, thinks it would be beneficial to others they go do this, they see things, they whatever, they come back and report it, and other people go, oh wow, you, you saw that, and you checked it out, and it's real, and it helps waken other people's minds up. So it's, it can waken them up, it can waken others up, and sometimes people just naturally, like we say, particularly children, sometimes people just naturally get into meditation states. They just relax and disappear, you know? That's just what they do. And when they do, they find themselves sometimes someplace else. You know, they see images, they see visions of things, and mostly they just blow it off and say, oh, I was just dreaming, you know, it was a daydream, and they don't think much about it until something happens that really startles them, and they see something that has information that they find out later is something that actually happened someplace, and then it frightens them. But it's just a natural thing. Some people just do that. I mean, going out of body is not a difficult thing that you have to do. You just have to let it happen. You have to be open, let your mind go. If you have an intent, you'll get that. If you don't have an intent, it's like going to Google 
in that little place that says, I'm feeling lucky, and you just click it, and it, it sends you something. You know? So you can just drift, and you'll start getting images and things. We just discount them. We blow them off and say, oh, I just was seeing junk because I was drifting around in the daydream, and I saw all this stuff, and we don't say, oh, I was in another reality frame, and this is what happened. But sometimes it's one, and sometimes it's the other. You may be creating it, or it may be outside of you. Only experience and working with it will tell the difference. If uh, each and all of us uh, live uh, our own reality, but at the same time we're creating a massive uh, reality uh, with the intent, should we conclude that the world is leaning uh, towards uh, um, manifesting itself under the intent that dominates, whether it's good or bad? What was the very last part of that question? Could you do just the last line? Yeah. Uh. Should we conclude, therefore, that the world leans towards manifesting itself under the intent that dominates? I understand that predominates. I don't know who made the question. Yes? That predominates good or okay, bad? Okay, I think I've got that. Um, we are creating this reality, and like I said, the reality is us. It reflects us the way we are. It reflects people who are basically operating on fear, and their intent is fear-based. That's what it reflects, and that's what we are. But it doesn't just create itself. We modify the probability of what's likely to happen next and the way it happens. We enable our leaders and our institutions to be the way they are, you see. But you have a rule set. The rule set says, here are the things that are probable this is really improbable, you know, this is highly likely, this stuff is improbable, so you get some distribution, and you go pick out of that distribution, so you're likely, you're likely, the highest probability is you'll pick something that's probable, because that's what distributions do, okay? So the rule set tells us what our options are, what we can do. We can't jump 20 feet in the air. You know, that's our options. We can't get hit over the head and get brain damage and not have it affect anything because the brain's just a virtual brain. The brain is the constraints on what the consciousness can do here. So it's, it's sort of, yes, we create our own reality in the sense that we manifest it from the probabilities that the rule set gives us. So, that's, so there's two things going on, and it's interactive. We're all interactive, so we have a what, over seven billion intents all at the same time. So it's a pretty big jumble of intents. What comes out of it is kind of the average of what we are. See, that's kind of the average level of evolution in the, on the planet is kind of what we see. There's some that's a lot better, there's some that's a lot worse, but in the jumble all kind of averages out to, to represent us, the people in an average way but it can only represent us within the constraints of the rule set. So we can't just create anything. We can't say, hey, everybody in the world, let's, let's um, have an intent that we can fly. We can flap our arms up and down and fly. Well, you can have that intent all you like, but the rule set says, no, it's not gonna work because that's not the way the, the physics, that's not the way the rules you know, allow us. So we make our reality, but within constraints. When you help a conscience, a consciousness makes its transition, do this consciousness perceives you as accompanying them? What has been your experience in doing that? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It kind of depends on the situation. Um, you can. You can stay in the background if you wish and just be an observer. That's possible. You can visit other, it's the same with other reality frames. If you go to another reality frame, you can do one of several things. 
you can just observe, in which case you're non-interactive. Nobody sees you, nobody interacts with you. You're just an observer. Or you can interact. You can manifest yourself a body in that place and walk around among them and, and do things and interact with them. Or you can just interact with them mentally, telepathically. So those are three different ways that you can interact. That's true in any interaction between entities that works. So when somebody's just, their, their virtual body is di has died and they're making the transition and you're a part of it, you can be an active part of it if you want. You can walk up, you know, you know take them in arm and, and, you know, greet them and say, hi, how you doing? You know, how do you feel? That kind of stuff. And they'll interact with you. Or you can just stay in the background and watch and see what happens. Or you can just communicate telepathically and put ideas, kind of communicate, share, share information in that way. So it, it's your choice as to how much you want to intervene. Now, if you go into these reality frames or when you're interacting with people passing over and you act badly, if you create problems, if you say things that make them more anxious instead of less, if, you're, if you become a nuisance, Basically, your, pass, your passport will be withdrawn and you won't get there anymore. You'll be grounded, you see. So the system isn't going to let you raise havoc, but so much. But now the system will give you a long rope because you have free will, but there's limits at which you can do. And yes, if we can go do that there, they can come do that here. So yes, you can get voices, you can get telepathic information, from the system or from other entities. Yes, other entities can form a body and walk around here for a while. And yes, they can just observe, just as we can. It's just consciousness, it's data. It's a data stream. They can tap in, they can join the game at an observer level as opposed to at a regular level. Or they can join the game at a regular level. But there's rules on how you do that. You can't create an inconsistency when you do that. If you're going, if you're allowed to actually manifest a body in another place and walk around and interact physically at that level, then you have to do it very carefully so you create no discontinuities, no problems there. That's if otherwise, like I say, your passport gets revoked and you're not allowed to do that anymore. So you have to play by the rules. It's not just, uh, you know, you're a cowboy and can go riding in and, and raise hell any way you want to. That uh, would not be, uh, you de-evolve that way, you see. With that attitude, you de-evolve, and as you de-evolve, you lose your ability to do these things. Are there bad entities? Evil entities? See, evil entities. Yes, there are bad entities. And the reason there are is that we have free will. You can't say, all right, children, all right, uh, IUOCs, in independent uh, individual units of consciousness, you have free will now as long as you do what I want. That's not free will. You have to say, you have free will, good luck. So entities can de-evolve and they can become negative and they can develop a certain amount of power in that negativity if they practice it and practice it because instead of developing quality at the being level, they can force, they can force a certain amount of, of uh, focus just by control and force. They can do that, and they can apply that in negative things. You have people that, you know, we hear of things like uh, voodoo and stuff like that, where they practice it in the, you know, West Indies and so on, and that's a real thing. If you know people that live along coastal Africa, you will know people who are very familiar with this. It's an endemic thing in their society. People make a living there by intimidating other people with making them ill, killing them, hurting their family by intent. You see, instead of healing, they're hurting. That's possible. 
So that's a negative entity. And you can find negative entities that aren't here in a physical body, that are just entities in some other reality frame. Okay? So yes, they do exist. But don't be frightened by that. Okay? The handle by which you can be by which you can be manipulated, by which things can happen to you that, that you wouldn't like, is your fear. If you have fear, then basically you can be bitten. If you don't have fear, you're basically invulnerable. Okay, so that's one thing. Secondly, the system's not gonna let you go where you don't belong. You will have to earn your way to, like I say, they can revoke your passport, you know, the way you, you know, that's just a metaphor, obviously. But the amount of breadth and depth to which you can explore has to do with, you have to earn that by slowly going out and dealing with things and dealing with them successfully. Otherwise, you are discouraged from your explorations. How do you get discouraged? Well, the larger consciousness system will scare you. You'll get out of body and you'll go, oh, I'm out, you know, and you'll look back, you'll see your body laying in the bed and you're doing this and that, and suddenly some big monster shows up and goes, Rrr! and you go, Rrr! and you run back to your body and now you don't do it anymore. That's just a fear test. It's a test to see how you react to things. How frightened are you? If you're frightened so that you scream and, and run back to the body, you're not really going back to the body, you know what I mean? If you drop the link, just another metaphor, if you drop the link because you're frightened, you're not ready yet. So that's one of the ways that the system polices it. You'll be given fear tests. There's really no big monster there. You're just being tested to see whether or not you're ready to come here. And the day that that big monster shows up and goes, grr, you turn around and say, get lost. You know? Give it your best shot, I don't care. I'm gonna explore here because I want to. And the monster goes away. That's your ticket, now you're in. You see, so there's fear tests that will keep you out before you're ready. The system wants to take care of you because if you go there and you're not ready and you have a terrible frightening experience, not just a monster jumps up and goes boo, but really a, a more terrifying experience than that, then that actually sets you back. You're a more fearful person now than you were before. So that experience has regressed you rather than progressed you forward. The system doesn't want that. So it will keep you out of where you don't belong because it doesn't want you to regress. It wants you to progress. In a war, maybe at the beginning because of revenge or power, the collective unconsciousness sought out that circumstance, that experience, maybe the creation of a leader or a few madmen, then with the passage of time, most people will want peace. And most of the times, this peace will not come easily. So there, the intention, even though it's the majority's will, doesn't work as we would hope. Well, the majority's will, if you will, the intention, of that majority is usually very fearful. And that fearful intention helps exacerbate the problem, you see. So it's not that you have a bunch of people thinking beautiful, wonderful thoughts about peace and tranquility and, and uh, love, and that they somehow get overridden. Most of the people are not thinking anything like that. They're all terrified. They're fearful. They, uh, you know, they want their side to win. They want the other side not to get them. They uh, have all this fear about how can they stay out of it? What's gonna happen to their family? How can they protect themselves? Da, da, da. And it's very fear-based. And as much time as they spend thinking about how awful it is, that helps maintain how awful it is. That adds to the whole thing. So I, I would disagree with the, with the idea that most of the people are sitting around you know, thinking happy thoughts. They may be yearning for peace, but they're yearning for peace on top of a barrel full of fear. Well, okay, here's a little intent for peace, and here's a whole bunch of intent for fear. Typically, the fear is a bigger 
there's more focus and there's more intensity to the fear than there is the peace is more of a wishful thinking than it is a real focused intent. And that's why it doesn't, you know, that's why the, you know, that majority doesn't seem to have much sway because they're very fearful. They're, ad they're adding to the problem. Yes, the leadership kind of started the problem, but the leadership was a reflection of them. You know, we look at our leaders and we say, these people are just awful. You know, they have no morals. You know, all they want is power. All they want to get is reelected again. All they want is control. They feed us propaganda. You know, they give us all this stuff. What terrible leaders they are. Well, if we took that leader and replaced him with this guy just in the street, we randomly go out, we pick some guy off the street, and we say, you're the leader now. Well, in the beginning, he'd say, oh, I'm the leader now. Love and peace, love and peace, everybody. We're going to have a wonderful world. I'm going to help all the poor people. Da, 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 and give him a year or two later, he's just like the last guy because he has power now. See, and with that power, he can get things done. He can have stuff. He can do all this. And pretty soon with that power, he starts manipulating things to be the way he wants them. He's in charge. Anything he says goes. And you've just gotten rid of one tyrant and you've collected another one. And I say that, not that there aren't anybody out there would, that would be better than that. I'm just saying average. You go out and take the kind of person that average is a reflection of us. And that's who you've got in there in the first place. Those people, we relate to those people. That's why we, re we elect them. It's, they represent us in more than just our, our intellect. They're like us. So the, the little guy who seems like he never does any harm, all he does is come home and holler at his wife, you know, uh, fuss at his children, kick the dog, and go watch TV. And you figure, well, he's pretty harmless. It's, he's harmless mostly because he doesn't have any power. If he had power, he wouldn't be so harmless. So all of us little peasants out here in the world who are aggravated with our, our evil leadership, we're not a whole lot better. We just don't have the power. What would we do if we were in there? Well, we'd have good ideas to start with. We find out how hard it is to deal in a world full of fear and how everybody's grasping to manipulate and control. And we'd figure that's the game. Well, if that's the game, that's the way you have to play it. And we'd get tough. And once we get tough, then we'd be sort of like them. So, unfortunately, that's a sad story, but that's kind of the way it is. And we see that in history. We see one revolution after another that turns out to be one boss to a different boss to a different boss. You get emperor after emperor after dictator after dictator. And even though the, re the revolution was about peace and, and prosperity for the little people, that somehow just never seems to happen. You see, there's an old saying that says, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, so that's, that's kind of who we are. So we're not the innocent little victims sitting out here, you know, yearning for peace, and the bad guys are running over us. We mostly are powerless. That's true. But we're not so much yearning for peace as we are terrified of not being able to keep ours and get what we need. It's still mostly about us, and we feed that same negative reality. You know, the, the, the concept that the, all the people are the good people and all the leaders are the, are the evil ones is just not true. It's not really like that.